Thanks so much for the opportunity. I think if there's one thing you get out of this talk, it's to gain some comfort with the ambiguity of the clinical presentations of patients with eczema. I think it's a fine day when someone walks into the office and they're on one polar extreme of spongiotic dermatitis, it's clearly eczema, or psoriasiform dermatitis, it's clearly psoriasis. And, and you could quickly get to a diagnosis and dispatch a therapy very quickly, but often they're in the middle there somewhere, and it's, it's not so obvious, and the declaration of their disease takes a bit of investigation and a little bit of a leap of faith on how you're gonna deal with that. These are my disclosures. I think the main thing is I'll be mentioning non-FDA approved allergens, which make up the majority of the North American series. So this is all eczema, right? Biopsy any of these disorders, AD, irritant allergic contact dermatitis, numular dyshydrotic, id, and I might be so bold as to say spongiotic drug eruptions, which are rare and a bit controversial. You get the same biopsy back. They're all red, scaly, lichenified, and, and they're itchy. And how in the world do you tell them apart sometimes? Other than some patterning, you're really relying on the history, the physical exam with some patterns, and, and some hope that you know there's some past, past uh, history that allows you to decide which one of these there are. But in this list, allergic contact dermatitis is the hubris of eczema. It's the swagger and pomposity of spongiotic dermatitis. And, and, and maybe it's well-deserved and we can explain that because if you look at this list, right, you just heard a, a great talk from, from Dr. Glick. We've been hearing for days about the pathophysiology of atopic dermatitis. Try explaining numular dermatitis to a patient or id reaction, right? You can get into, you know, there's a temporary problem with IL-13 and IL-4, and if it's chronicity, you might get IL-22 with acanthosis and IL-31 with itch. That's pretty complicated. Pretty easy to say, hey, that lanolin in your moisturizer is causing this eczema. If you get rid of that, it's going to get better, right? That's pretty easy. And, and, and a pretty valuable tool. So my bias always is when you have chronic spongiotic dermatitis or chronic eczematous dermatitis, getting out the patch testing can be pretty helpful. And, and you saw the list of uh, what, what we had published on, uh, from the guidelines of care on comorbidities. That list took a long time to put together and you see things like maybe associated. Well, it's all based on the depth of data, but but Eczematous dermatitis like AD and contact dermatitis seem to be comorbid and overlap a great deal. So patients with difficult to treat AD, those failing two or more topical therapies where the patient ought to get better and they don't, when they're patch tested, have this remarkable, almost unbelievable result of three quarters had allergic contact dermatitis. 40% of them were polysensitized to multiple allergens like lanolin, uh, surfactant, cocoa betaine, um, chromates, and fragrances. Second bolts from a paper we published just two, three years ago, looking at all of the articles on AD and atopic, uh, AD and contact dermatitis. How close do they come together? And it seems like there's a preponderance of evidence that those with AD do get more frequent patch test reactions to lanolin, fragrances, preservatives, and not surprisingly, corticosteroids from their regular use. But if that doesn't convince you, how surprising is it that if you put a North American 70 or 80 on, I think a great fundamental patch test series. And if you want to hear more about that, let us know. I'm happy to discuss it further at future meetings. But you take that North American 70 or 80, you patch test them, and you add some others based on their history. A fifth of the patients that were tested had a reaction to patch test allergens above and beyond the 70 and 80, so like number 84, number 101. And when you looked at who that group was that did that the most, it was the atopic group. Atopics get allergic contact dermatitis. Let's remember it's delayed type hypersensitivity. Look at 48 hours. This is a largely metal series, the orthopedic implant series, where people are putting things in their hips and knees and in their mouth. Right, you see palladium and vanadium on the left. They're, they're popping up. I could read that right out of the gate. But look at the 50 series, nothing there, right? 51 or 54 looks completely normal. Don't expect to see anything. Wait a couple of days later, nickel and cobalt pop up. 
So it's, it's delayed, you gotta give it time, you wear the patches for two days, and then you look at them a day later, two days later, and for some allergens, even a little later out than that. It's a pretty typical mild AD case that was sent in to me for patch testing, right? A little antecubital fossa, bit on the neck and chin. There's always that one finger you can't get better, right? No matter what they put on. And so I, I didn't think much of the case, but the, the consulting person, the person sending in for me um, said, I think they have contact dermatitis, and this was her back, right? And the elimination of things like methylisothiazolinone, tosylamide formaldehyde um, resin like in nail polish and fragrances got her almost clear with no therapy. Looked like AD, smelt like AD, but those patch tests said something different because they overlap all the time. And then we're digging it, we're getting into the weeds here, but contact, all contact dermatitis is not the same. You see that nickel reaction? You know if you biopsy, that's coming back psoriasiform, spongiotic dermatitis, right? It's lichenified and thick enough for that. Don't think I'd biopsy those eyelids from cocoa betaine or surfactant and shampoo, but maybe I'd get like a sebderm eczema looking biopsy back there. And of course the ones, the one from Bacitrace and eyes, that's acute. That's going to be acute and spongiotic. So contact dermatitis looking different under different circumstances. And if we look at the patch test reactions, they don't all look the same either. Look at fragrance mix one versus propylene glycol versus gold versus cobalt. They all three look different and it is not the fact that one's a one plus a two plus a three plus. They are morphologically looking different. And there's cobalt with its typical acrosyringeal hemorrhage in there. That's a negative irritant reaction. So, what am I getting at here is that contact dermatitis is not a single pathophysiologic disorder. We used to think it's all Th1, right? Th1 was contact dermatitis. Th2 is atopic dermatitis, and Th17 is psoriasis. And, and, and that was all, we were happy as clams thinking that. But it looks like if we dig a little bit deeper in, things like nickel do do a classic Th1, but recruit Th17 in as well. And fragrances can cause Th2 and Th22 skewing. Methyl chloroisothiazolinone, Th2 skewing. It's going to look and it's going to behave like atopic dermatitis just from an outside source. And I've shown just a number of other um, well-known allergens and, and the pathways that they sometimes take. And we know, like itch in atopic dermatitis from IL-31, we see it in contact dermatitis. There's nothing very unique about some of these eczematous dermatitides that makes it so easy to put in their comfortable little silos, and then we go ahead and, and try to treat them. There's a lot of overlap. And if we're deploying all of these medications, you've got your small molecules. These are the 2014 guidelines of care, and we're in the middle of uh, guidelines that are updated but we've got dupilumab and tralokinumab, each with its unique mechanism, and we have JAK1, uh, selective JAK1 inhibitors with their unique mechanisms, and how does that all play into contact dermatitis? Well, let's look at an old one, methotrexate. A bunch of methotrexate patients with eczema were patch tested, about half of them were positive. It's a pretty good international number. If you patch test people half to 60%, if you test them to a 70 or 80 panel, they'll have positive reaction. And they had pretty decent mean doses. And when they looked at the number of reactions before methotrexate and after methotrexate, they're looking at them before and after, no difference between the number of reactions under the influence of methotrexate or by control. That seems pretty straightforward, but they're just counting patches. They're just catching patch tests. It's like, this is three units, and this is three units. And they're not the same, right? Um, the puppies, um, Jamie Wadowski, PA, um, our team, one of, one of the best around, um, uh, loves dogs. So um, I put that there. But one will make you rich in your pocketbook. The other one will make you rich in your heart. But they're not the same. Let's, let's look at the list. Look at the control list and what allergens came up, and look at the methotrexate list. What happened to gold? What happened to hair dye 
between the, the uh, control group and the methotrexate group. They may have the same numbers, they're not the same allergens. Something is influencing their reactivity. Something is pressurizing one side and relieving another side. We could look at systematic reviews um, before and after immunosuppression, testing the same people. Cyclosporin, half your patch tests will disappear. Prednisone, at any dose, you'll lose some of your patch test reactions. Forget azathioprine, they were testing parthenium, which is like a poison ivy airborne material. Th that didn't get affected by azathioprine. But if you looked at this study, AD patients with or without allergic contact dermatitis, and the investigators could not tell the difference when they were put on dupilumab. That says two things. One, the, the uh, ACD was not relevant, right? Those patch tests didn't mean anything. Or that dupilumab was suppressing the reactivity to those contact allergens. You, it's one or the other. And then here's a different study with AD patients with atopic dermatitis, and they saw some got better, some got a little better, and some got worse. Because maybe if you're suppressing Th2, you allow Th1 activity to occur. So the long and the short of it is, it really depends what you're patch testing. It depends on what the patient's reacting to, and that will depend on what kind of readings you get if you decide to patch test while on drug and I think it's probably not a good idea to routinely do that if you, if you can avoid it. The patch tests are inherently um, not very reliable over time, right? You take patients at baseline, patch test them. Now do it at six months later to two years later. Almost one in five will have one of the patch tests lost, maybe because they've been avoiding it and you've lost that response. About a quarter will have more positive patch tests and about half have no change in the number, and of those with no change in the number, most don't have a change in the allergens. But there's a lot of variability. It's a live action biologic test. So it led me to, to write this uh, short paper, Dupilumab for Allergic Contact Dermatitis and Patch Testing. There are articles that say, Dupilumab does not influence patch test results. And there are a bunch of papers that say dupilumab treats allergic contact dermatitis from some allergens. You can't have it both ways. It can't work in one and not affect the reading of, an, of the patch test, which is just simply a recapitulation of allergic contact dermatitis under a chamber. So if you look at this list of the top allergens, you see multiple mechanisms by which that occurs, not a single unified allergic contact dermatitis mechanism. And you see fragrances, hypervariable. Fragrances alone represent two or 3,000 individual chemicals, and it's hard to keep track of them. Look at this one. These are natural sensitizers in some of these. These are really unknown mechanisms. Look at this conditioner. Uh, just like Mother Earth used to make. I, 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 when did Mother Earth used to make conditioners? Was some kind of like meteor that took out the conditioning making plants? You know, like the dinosaurs had conditioner, but we don't. Or this gel is so green, you'll grow leaves. I just hope I don't smell when I come out. I don't need to grow leaves, right? And this one, another real search situation for me. Um, in Kentucky, going to give grand rounds. This is the bar soap in the hotel, and it's a rum bar soap, 3% rum eau de toilette, right? This makes you smell like rum, right? And, and what happens is in early in the morning, if you smell like rum, you feel subconscious about it, and you start telling people, I, I really didn't drink this morning. It was the soap, okay? And the more you say that, the more people start leaning in and say, this guy's a drinker, right? Like, he, we got a problem here. He's protesting too much, and, and that's what happens here. Look at all the fragrances, linalool, linalool limonene, citronellol, geraniol, all newly emerging common contact allergens that you miss if you just put a true test on. I'm going to finish with flares. We used to think for a long time, and I didn't know where it came from, that those with atopic dermatitis were thought to be protected against allergic contact dermatitis. In fact, they were mutually exclusive to the point of protection. And I found this quote in 1936 from the American uh, Medical Association meeting with Marion Sulzberger, and he said, 
those with, the con with contact dermatitis, those in the atopic group, um, were reacting to much fewer things than the control group, and it stuck with us for a long time. Turns out that's probably not the case. Atopic patients have, on certain circumstances, more allergic contact dermatitis, and sensible pragmatic patch testing is wait for a flare to settle, but if the back is clear, proceed in testing, and using systemic immunosuppressants can and likely will have some influence on your patch test reading. You gotta read into it a little more. There's a hazard of false negatives. It doesn't mean you can't do it or shouldn't do it. There's some patients, the minute you take them off a drug, they flare up, there's no clear back. You can't test them. So you keep them on low dose of drug, you test them, and you do your best to read into those marginal reactions. Um, but please do think about patch testing. This is an audience of very like-minded people, right? We're interested in inflammatory diseases, and patch testing is one of those tools to elucidate causes of aggravation and, and even the result of causing straight eczematous dermatitis. So thank you for your kind attention on that. Look forward to hearing questions when I'm out there. <laughs>